Crystal read really well yesterday, didn't she? Mm, she did. yeah. um, so I have a reading. Right at the end of Mark's Gospel. Just verses 14 and 15, really. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating, and he rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptised will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons, speak in new tongues, pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on people who are ill, and they will get well. Mm. I wonder why sometimes in other countries you see a lot of this laying your hands on the sick and them getting well. Some really big miracles. And we see them over here, but much less so, don't we? But maybe, is it because we don't preach the Gospels much? I don't know. Are the two things related? I think... The signs and wonders follow the preaching of the word, don't they? And perhaps we don't preach the word. And we're in here, all nice and cosy, preaching the word. That's good. It builds us up. But it's a world out there that needs to hear the word, isn't it? There's a world out there that needs to hear the word. And so the message I've got today is, what's your gospel presentation like? What's your gospel present? We ought to, the, the Bible says in um, 1 Peter 3.15, you need to have a reason for the hope inside you. And be able to, you know, people ask you, you need to be able to give a reason. So we're Christians, we follow, we're followers of Jesus, and we call ourselves Christians. So we need to have a reason. Why are we Christians? Well, normally we have a testimony, don't we? Yes. So quite a good way of sharing the gospel is to start with your testimony. Well, this is what happened to me, and then God did this, and then that happened, and then the other. But I mean, your testimony of how you got saved is is valid. They overcome, um, it says in Revelation, by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. But we also need to be able to present a gospel to anybody who wants to know what is a gospel. And I'm on a mission at the minute. I used to be an evangelist, so I used to be presenting the gospel all the time. But I got very discouraged with it because not many people wanted to listen to it. I was working for Hull Youth for Christ back in the 1980s with Ian Whaler, who you know well. He was director of it then in those days. And uh, we just would go up to people and share the gospel. Well, those people are busy, especially in town, like they're shopping and doing things. You know. And we also used to do door-to-door. -door. No one does door-to-door -door anymore, if you notice. Lots of doors have on them. Don't knock on my door if you're doing door to door, or salesman, or religion, or whatever. Or sign saying, please don't do it. I think the JWs still do it. <coughs> so, how do we share the gospel? And St. Francis of Assisi said, share the gospel all the time, and if you have to, use words. In other words, your life should show the gospel. I think we need words, we need, we need to understand the gospel and we need to be able to put it into words and that has to work for each one of us. And I've, I've come up, looked at four ways that you could present the gospel and I want to go through each four of those and just make you think so that you can think of a way that you can present the gospel to somebody who, who, who needs to hear it. In a minute I'm... Uh, taking teas and coffees to a group of homeless people just down the street from us and they're sleeping in a like an old porchway and uh, I said to them I'm going to bring you the gospel and it's literally going to bring them the gospel and then I did my back in so I couldn't get out to them but that probably was the enemy and uh, I said if, if that's alright with you I'm going to bring you the gospel I just want to tell you the gospel see what you make of it but I must confess there's a fear inside me there's like an uneasiness inside me about doing it. Um, and I think I, that used to be the case when I was a evangelist, but I overcame that. And when you're doing it every day, you kind of get into a motion of it. And you have a few introductory words that you normally use to start a conversation. And I'm sort of bereft of all that at the moment. I, all, all that's, I, 
I've left all that behind because I haven't been doing it for years. And I'm also not as confident in myself as I was say, a year ago. We've all not back you know, in the last couple of years. I lack confidence. But the Bible doesn't say share the gospel if you are confident. It says share the gospel. The Bible doesn't say have a reason for the hope inside of you if you're confident in having a reason. It just says do it. And I feel inadequate. You know, everything I do at the moment, I feel inadequate in it. Uh, but here are four ways to do the gospel. Way number one. The man who conquered death. Each one of us is going to die. So when you're talking to somebody and you're going to give the gospel this way, you have immediately something in common with them. They're going to die. You're going to die. We're all going to die. But there is a man who died and yet is not dead. He came back to life. And you say to me, well, that's impossible. I mean, in, in an actual, that's impossible. So you're talking to someone and that's just impossible. But you say, well, hold on a minute. That man, Yeshua, in the Hebrew, Jesus, in the Greek, we don't know much about how he was born, but it's very well attested how he died. Uh, you have um, Josephus records the, the death of Jesus in his history of the antiquities of, look, antiquities of the Jews and the Roman um, historian, whose name I can't remember now. <laughs> I know he's got four, four names. Gaius is one of them, the only one I can remember. Publius, Gaius, somebody or other records the same thing. So Jesus' death was well recorded in history. He was a real person. He really lived, he really died. And then he came back to life. And the Bible tells us, and history also records for us outside of the Bible, that his disciples went around saying that he came back to life. Now, his disciples would be the hardest people to fool, wouldn't they? Because they lived with him. So if it was a ghost, they'd know it was a ghost. If it was Jesus, they know it was Jesus. If he was dead, they know he was dead. I mean, when he was three days in the tomb, they were hiding from the Jewish leaders, fearful for their life. Something turned them around from being fearful for their life to being confident and bold, going out doing the miracles he was doing and sharing the gospel that he's alive. You know, you can't fake that. That's not fakeable. And you can check that in the historical record just outside the Bible as well as in the Bible. So that's way number one that I would present it. That's probably my favourite way of presenting it. Because I say to people, if somebody can overcome death, then they have the keys to death. That's why they death, don't they? And if you get to know that person, you too can have the life they have. That's the promise. Well, how, do I, how do I know that I can have the life that Jesus has? Well, you have to get to know him. So you have to seek him. God says, you know, I'll be found if you seek me. A lot of people, atheists in particular, say, well, we've never, we can't find God. We've got no proof of God. There's no proof. Therefore, there's no God. Well, they don't seek him because they're not seeking him. They don't find him. I mean, it's what I will say. It's clear. Seek me with all your heart and you'll find me. So I would go about it that way. That's number one. Number two, I have to net this. And her gospel presentation is based on that personal relationship with Jesus. And the thing with the personal... She did. She's... I didn't know. The mother asked the question. I didn't know she was... Okay, right. Yeah. But... Uh, and you see, you start with the assumption that there is a God who made everything. It doesn't work if you don't believe that. That's the assumption. But most people actually, if they're not sure, they think that's at least a possibility. God, there is a God and he made everything because they look at stuff and they think, well, it couldn't just, just happen. The atheists will swear blindly it just happened. Randomly by chance. But that doesn't seem very likely to me. And I don't think it seems very likely to most people. So there's a God, but you're, you don't know that God very well, if, if at all. So therefore there must be a gap between you and that God. You know, there's got to be something stopping you guys relating. I mean, maybe that the God doesn't want to relate to you, but then why did He create you? He must want to have a relationship with you if He made you and you believe He made you. And so, you haven't got one. Why? And then you can introduce the concept of sin. 
well, it's sin that's caused this problem. And then you can introduce the concept of Jesus dying on the cross for our sin. Like he's the perfect sin offering. Back in the old days, they used to sacrifice sheep, you could say. But Jesus died once and for all. There's a lot of assumptions in that. You, you, you've got to, people, you have to, to assume that people know a little bit about sin, what sin is. And they tend not to nowadays. Or they know a bit about what the Old Testament says about sin. Um, you, you probably had one of those tracks in your hands where, where, where there was a gap between man and God and then there was a cross across it with Jesus written on it. You, you ever see those? Very popular they were at one time. And that works really well for people who have a bit of Bible knowledge. And so for a whole generation, 50s, 60s, 70s, worked really well because we grew up with some knowledge of Scripture. But they don't grow up with any of that now. So you're ending up with that presentation, or sin-based presentation, of having to explain a lot of stuff that you could have took for granted 40 years ago, but you can't. There's the familial gospel, the familial presentation of the gospel. And this is the presentation that the church has used for well over a thousand years. It is, it goes a bit like this. You can be part of the family of God if you just come to church, uh, do the sacraments, or do, do the Our Fathers, or the Reverend Breeds, or the Hail Marys, or whatever. You can be part, you know, it's familiar, you're part of the family. All you have to do is conform to what everybody else is doing, and the Lord will bless you. That's actually the mechanism that the church used for years. That's how all of the Western Europe was Christianized. All of Europe was Christianized that way. You know, the prince of Russia many years ago decided to convert to Christianity. It was Orthodox Greek Christianity. And he just insisted that all his courtiers also convert. You know, it's like, I'm converting, you've all got to do it. And then whole nations got to convert. And so that's how Russia became uh, a, an Orthodox Christian country. And that was, Charlemagne converted most of Western Europe on pain of death. He simply said, convert to Christianity or we'll kill you. Which is not a very good way of going about it, is it? But there's something in it. There's something in people who don't ever hear the gospel message. They just want to belong to the family of God. And they see something in us. If we are shining out love for one another, and they want to be part of it, and that then they pick up the message about Jesus as they get into relationship with us. Do you see? That's the, like the familial, family-style presentation of the gospel. There's one more which I'll go over very briefly because it's not one that many people use at all. It's very intellectual. It's the gospel of right and wrong. And uh, has anyone read Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis? It's his epic work. Have you read it? Well, it's good. He presents this in chapter 2. He presents this. Uh, it's a um, philosophical argument for the existence of God and the devil and God being superior to the devil and it's completely based on man's philosophy so he's used the philosophy of his time which would have been the early 20th century and he has presented a case, presents a case for God to exist because all the other philosophers of his period Nietzsche and all, were all presenting cases for there being no God at all so he said no look Look at it like this, and it goes through it. And I think I'm not going to go into it because you just go. Well, do you know what I mean? <laughs> but it it worked for a generation at that time. There were a generation of clever Cambridge and Oxford people who looked at the writings and the philosophy of C.S. Lewis and said, "Yeah, that's right. There must be a God. There must be a God." So the good news of gospel only makes sense in the context of bad news as well. This is something else that's really important. People nowadays, they think, if they think at all, that when they die, that's it. 
They're not exactly sure what happens next, but you know, most likely it's nothing. We know different, don't we? Most likely they think, when I die, nothing will happen. That'll be the end. Darkness, blank, finished. Um, but the Bible tells us that it's appointed unto men once to die and then to be judged. And there's a judgment after death that's coming. And as a result of that judgment, you go to one of two places. To be with Jesus, we call that heaven, or to permanently be without God, we call that hell. And so if you live your life without God, you go to the place without God. And if you live your life with the Lord, with God, with Jesus, then you go to that place with Jesus. That's the judgment. It's not a judgment on what you've done. It's not a judgment on what you know. It's a judgment on who you know. It's not what you know. It's who you know. Do you know Jesus? Do you know me? Or will he say to you, away from me, I never knew you? Or will he say, come in, sit down? And, and it's all in, that's all in the scripture. And, but people don't have that background. Of, you, you know, if you go and have seen it done, preaching on the street corner, you're all going to hell. Unless it's, people just are offended by that because, not that it's untrue, but because they don't have any concept of what that is. They just don't understand the message. So they think it, the person who's shouting it out is just being offensive. And uh, the people who are shouting out, I'm sure their intention is to warn, to warn others. But because there's no connection with their message, the warning is lost. And it's just, who's this crazy person and upsetting our children, you know. So there's something to be said for all of those different ways of presenting the gospel but what I really felt in my heart for you guys and for me is you need to find your own way of presenting the gospel what does Jesus mean to you how are you going to tell how are you going to share that faith with somebody else you need to think about that carefully and maybe practice on some people that you know some people who you can practice on to start with and then when you feel a bit more confident you could just try it on random strangers that the Lord puts into your heart to talk to or people that you come across see here's the issue we are now a tiny church and we could go on a big campaign of trying to attract other Christians into the building and but because we're not a new church because we have some baggage that's going to be hard to do in women's because women's is a, is a place where everyone knows everyone's business it's like that small town mentality where there's just continual gossip going around tell me I'm wrong but I believe that to be the case <laughs> is that my right? <laughs> from my experiences yes <laughs> yeah so but the thing is I think Lord's in coming to us in a season and saying I want to grow your number out of people who don't yet know me and how will they know me if nobody tells them do you see what I'm saying? And so you and I each have to find a way of presenting the gospel in a way that people can understand, in a way that makes sense to us. And it, for everyone it will be slightly different. It will all be the same basics. You'll have a Jesus in there, you'll have a death on the cross in there, you'll have a resurrection in there. There will be lots of common elements, but there'll be, it needs to be your story and your way of telling it to folk. Do you understand? And you say, well, that's a bit much, Tim, and I'm not very comfortable with that. I'm quite happy coming to church. I don't really want to do that. But the Bible says, go and preach my gospel to all creation. That's what it says. So it's not really me telling you what to do. It's the word of the Lord saying to you that's what to do. See, I said this yesterday. It's like a... Uh, a jam sandwich like a Victoria sponge. First we go and give the gospel. Then the Holy Spirit comes and converts people. They get saved. And then the next thing we have to do is disciple them. So we're told in, in the Mark, go preach the gospel. And in the Matthew, go make disciples. We can only make disciples when they're here. First we have to go and, and preach the word. 
the gospel. Then the Holy Spirit has to convict those people and they have to get saved. And only then can we make disciples. It has to be that sequence. It can't be any other way around. Does that make sense? So I'm putting a bit of an onus on all of us now. And particularly because we're small, we're struggling, and Annette and I have to come down all the way from Bridlington, and we need a church that is vibrant again, and able to stand on its own two feet. And I believe that's what the Lord wants. Uh, you know, I'm heartened by the fact that we've got so many young kids in church. I don't know any other churches that have that. They're mostly all old folk. And I'm an old folk, so I don't particularly mind old folk. <laughs> but I've always said you need every single generation present for a church to thrive. So we have like the seeds of being able to thrive. But we need to expand and grow again and be in that process of growing like we once were. And I believe that's going to be by us sharing the gospel, which has, you have to be deliberate about. You have to decide, hmm, how am I going to share the gospel? You have, to have that thought process with an imaginary person thinking, how am I going to tell them? Am I going to use my testimony? Am I going to use one of these four methods that Tim's talked about? What am I going to do? And, and that process starts with us being deliberate and deciding that, yes, we're going to obey what God says. We're going to share the gospel. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for being with us today. Thank you that you are in our midst and in our presence and you're wanting to do great things in this church. We can't see them yet, Lord. We just see disappointments and we see troubles and we see rumours and we see gossip. But the seed is there for great things. And it starts with the preaching of your gospel to this neighbourhood. And so I just pray an anointing now upon your people just to fall upon them. Holy Spirit power for boldness to go and preach your word and to find that gospel that they're comfortable with giving. In Jesus' name, amen. And I'm standing on a rock, on a rock of ages, standing on a rock. Never change.